Please, Roma, you have the floor. Sorry? You have the floor, Roma, please. You can start. Okay. Hello. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone and welcome to this crucial webinar. Wherever you're watching us or joining us from across the globe, this webinar is titled Thyroid, Improving Thy Global Health Through Thyroid Awareness. On this note, I am going to be your host. My name is Iroma Ofotube. I am the president, the founder of Thyroid Awareness and Support Initiative. I am also a thyroid disease survivor. TASI in short form is a, is a, a non-profit organization registered in Nigeria and based in Nigeria. We are committed and dedicated to promoting thyroid awareness and um, supporting people affected with thyroid disease in Nigeria and in the Sub-Saharan Africa at large. So on this seminar today, we are collaborating with Thyroid Federation International of which TASI is a member country representing Nigeria and Thyroid Care Association, whose founder is one of our speakers. It is, there's no gain saying the facts that thyroid disorders are among the major health challenges globally. Obviously, um, significant attention has not been given to providing solutions and also access. Hence, the increasing cases of thyroid disease globally, especially in Africa, which Nigeria belongs to. So on that note, it has become imperative that the stakeholders collaborate and gather together to share knowledge, expertise, and best practices in promoting thyroid health, addressing all thyroid related issues while improving global health. So I would like at this juncture to extend our warm gratitude to the president and the board of trustees of Thyroid Federation International, TFI, and the Thyroid Care Association for your continued support and uh, your dedication and commitment to uh, improving and supporting patient organizations. And to our esteemed speakers, Dr. Adefemi and uh, Afolabi and um, Dr. Theophilo San Louis, our warm gratitude for showing up and accepting this responsibility for today. So, thankfully, I want you all to settle down and have a very wonderful time today because we have a lineup of brilliant presentations and discussions ahead of us with questions and answers that will be addressed by our presenters. In this seminar, we aim, to collab we aim to foster collaboration, inspire action, share knowledge to improve thyroid health globally. I wish you all a fruitful and enlightening webinar experience today. Thank you once again for joining us. Stay blessed. 
at this juncture, we're going to be introducing the first speaker of today, Dr. Teofilo Samnui. Dr. Teofilo Prof, he's a, pro, he's a prof, sorry, we are used to calling him Dr. Teofilo. <laughs> Dr. Professor Teo is a professor of medicine at the University of Santo Thomas in Manila, Philippines. He was the former dean at the St. Luke's Medical Center College of Medicine. That is William H. Casa Memorial in Quezon, Quezon City, Metro Manila. He is currently the national coordinator of the Iodine Global Network in the Philippines. Is going to come and throw light, more light on what about Dyro Mobile and what he has been doing with he's doing wonderfully in, Phil in the Philippines with Dyro Mobile, making so much impact in both the rural and the urban areas of the Philippines. Dr. Tio, welcome to this wonderful webinar today. Thank We're you very much. Privilege to have you. Thank you very much also, uh, Lady Iruma, for the uh, invitation to speak before you and the uh, rest of the uh, community interested in thyroid health. Uh, my presentation is uh, pre-recorded and it can start now. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Philippines and to the annual celebration of the International Thyroid Awareness Week 2024 by the Thyroid Federation International. Again, welcome to the Philippines and uh, for the International Thyroid Awareness Week webinar 2024. I'd like to thank the organizers of the uh, seminar series, especially Madam Iruma for the topic that was given to me, improving global health through awareness of thyroid disorders. I am again, I'm Teofilo San Luis Jr. I am a medical doctor uh, and in charge of the Thyromobile project in the Philippines. What I will be discussing is for the talk on the International Thyroid Awareness Week and uh, on the outline of the presentation, I will be defining what is global health, what is non-communicable diseases, which is after all the uh, theme of the International Thyroid Awareness Week this year, thyroid disease as non-communicable disease. We'll be speaking of the thyroid disorders and more particularly iodine deficiency disorders. And we'll be looking at the iodine global scorecard, more particularly on the vulnerability of pregnant and lactating women. And the subject matter of this webinar, the Tyromobile, it's why, it's what, and it's where for. Global health, what is global health? We all very well know, we have just experienced a pandemic and this is an area of study, research, and practice that places priority on improving health. It seeks to achieve equity in health for all people worldwide by emphasizing transnational health issues, determinants and solutions, just like what we had in the pandemic. And you very well know, and you have experienced that it involved a lot of many disciplines beyond the health sciences and it needed interdisciplinary collaboration and denoting population-based prevention with individual level clinical care. The last word prevention is something very critical for us as uh, the Tyromobile seeks to prevent many of the things that we want to uh, eliminate in uh, iodine deficiency disorders. Non-communicable diseases are diseases that are not spread through infection or through other people. They are typically caused by unhealthy behaviors, 
They are chronic induration and they are leading cause of death worldwide. They present a huge threat to health and development, particularly in low and middle income countries. It is a cause of death that accounts for millions, particularly cardiovascular diseases, cancers, chronic respiratory diseases, diabetes, and its kidney manifestation. These four diseases account for over 80% of all premature NCD deaths. And these NCDs, cited above, kill 41 million people, equivalent to 74% of all deaths globally. It's really a figure that merits investigation. Thyroid disorders, as we very well know, the thyroid gland is the master gland. It controls metabolism. It has a role in health and well-being. And there are two uh, disorders that are more particularly related to the clinical setting. This is hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism. And uh, they lead to health issues like diabetes, obesity, atherosclerosis, growth disorders, hypertension, osteoporosis, infertility, sexual dysfunction, and endocrine cancers. So while we look at these diseases as if they are existing independently, they are, as a matter of fact, related to one another, especially with thyroid as the underlying uh, manifestation. Unfortunately, thyroid disorders are not yet considered to be non-communicable diseases. Maybe in the next few years, maybe hopefully even earlier, they will already be considered by the WHO as uh, a non-communicable disease. We'll wait for developments. Iodine deficiency disorders, they affect 1.6 billion people. They are at risk for thyroid disorders. And iodine deficiency, or IDD, has often been labeled to be, oh, it's just simply a nutritional issue. It is as if it's a non-issue, but it is a growing issue that is uh, a result of declining iodine intake in many parts of the world, especially fewer and fewer countries are mandating universal salt iodization policies because of uh, differences in agriculture and industry practices and regulations among countries. And uh, therefore, there are a lot of inconsistencies in the supplementation practices. There is a need to monitor the iodine status of at least of at least population and public health initiatives appear to be warranted. These are important things that we need to talk about. And here is the graphic example of iodine deficiency. The most visible effect is that of goiter, but the most vicious effect is that of retarded cognition and growth. These two boys, one, one coming from Morocco with a multinodular goiter, and one coming from China, it appears to be very cute, but actually, he is mentally retarded. So this is the most visual effect, vicious effect of uh, iodine deficiency. Now here is a little bit uh, medical, and I'd like to uh, call your attention to the bottom, which speaks of the gestational age in months in a woman who is pregnant and the baby is. Uh, developing from just from uh, age uh, one month and uh, there are already this uh, vital formative events in the human central nervous system development as you can see all the blue colored boxes or triangles they represent the major formative events especially in the first six months 
even after that, until birth and beyond that, there are still events that are happening in the brain for the uh, central nervous system. And I'd like to point out to you that uh, all of these events, especially in the first six months, are influenced by the T4 or the thyroid hormone coming from the mother. As you can see in the orange line, that the T4 from the mother until six months, it's only until it's only from six months that the babies or the child's thyroid gland is now functioning, that the child is now producing its own T4. But critical period is from the first month, <clears throat> from the first month until the sixth month, this is exclusively from the mother. So if the mother herself is iodine deficiency, she does not have anything to give to her child. And what we are going to see is that the next slide shows the great difference between the brain in the upper panel and the brain in the lower panel which speaks for themselves. As you can see, the upper panel is that of the human brain coming uh, with iodine sufficiency. There is a lot of uh, interconnection, a lot of arborization uh, in comparison with the brain tissues in the lower panel, which is iodine deficient. And so it strikes everyone that uh, the iodine sufficiency right from the very beginning is uh, or has to be has to be assured with uh, with uh, especially in the first critical six months of uh, gestation and we have only 1000 days of opportunity to do this from conception as we have said until birth and until the age of two years this is the 1000 days of opportunity with which we need to do interventions. Otherwise, if the child has been born and now goes to school, so to speak, the child will have, as you can see in the picture, all of the classmates are uh, raising their hands. But there are two of these boys who are not raising their hands. What do we make out of them? So iodine deficiency reduces intelligence education and productivity and as we very well know they impact on the sustainable development growth of who so this cartoon again demonstrates what seems to be uh, the message that the that we are trying to convey the mother and the teacher each will have his or her own problem of dealing with the child. The, mother, the teacher is uh, there agonizing on the fact that the child is, uh, has failed again the exam, while the mother is wondering why the child, her child is slow in school, whereas when in fact he tries so hard. But the answer to this is, that iodine deficiency lowers mental performance. Now we say something about iodine, but how much iodine do we need? As you can see in the picture, uh, seafoods represent the most uh, source of uh, iodine in our diet, but it's not always seafood that we are after to eat. Iodized salt is the solution to this and this is the uh, prescribed uh, this prescription coming from the iodine global network that uh, iodized salt which is properly and adequately iodized is the most uh, efficient and most effective in meeting the population requirement for iodization but there are of course other food stuff as you can see in the as you can see in the picture, uh, dairy products comprise also a significant portion 
as well as fish and of course the fruits and vegetables that uh, are grown. And uh, now, especially with the iodized salt in processed foods, we need to really be interworking with uh, the salt industry, uh, how they process their foods, because it is now a fact that many of our, many of the world are eating processed foods more and more and preparing uh, food less and less in their homes. Again, iodine supplementation is important, especially during pregnancy and lactation because, uh, and, but there are greedy recommendations vary from country to country because of their different policies. They, there are also varying contents of the frequently used prenatal supplements that uh, are available. And of course, each woman complies differently from the other. So let's take a look at the IDING Global Network scorecard. And we can see here Nigeria, your country, and uh, your neighboring countries of Ghana, Central African Republic, and Equatorial Guinea. Uh, with uh, the dates of their respective surveys, the data type, whether it's national or subnational, and the population survey, whether it's school age children or women at reproductive age or all of them. And we can see here in the last two columns the important uh, messages of this scorecard that uh, the median urinary iodine concentration is expressed in numbers and the adequacy of iodine intake is uh, determined. Uh, it's too bad that uh, there are countries that uh, do not have regular updated uh, uh, surveys. And uh, as you can see here, the Central African Republic, the median UIC is only 21, and that is very insufficient. In contrast, in Equatorial Guinea, the median iron concentration is 564 micrograms per liter, and that is, well, too excessive. So you can see that even among neighboring countries, there are variations in their global scorecard. We'd like to add to that the Philippines. Uh, we just had our, well, it's not really new, but 2018, 2019, on this school aged children and women of reproductive age, particularly pregnant and lactating women. And you can see here that the score of 180 for school age children is adequate, but for pregnant and lactating women of only 99, this is insufficient. And uh, that's the reason why we have embarked on a project that will cover the Philippines as uh, shown in this uh, slide. The, the Philippines, as you very well know, is an archipelago and all of those red uh, designated provinces, they are provinces, uh, 15 of them, they are the, you may say, the epicenter of iodine deficiency in the Philippines. And this is uh, more uh, understandable, as you can see here, the listing of the provinces from 1 to 15. And the second column shows the median urinary iodine concentration which should be more than 100, but as you can see here, Zamboanga del Norte as number one has only 57. And the third column there is that of the proportion of urinary iodine level of less than 50 micrograms per liter. It should be less than 20. And again, you will see Zamboanga del Norte scoring with 42. So you can see the distinction of Sambuangal del Norte as the, well, you may say, valedictorian of the group. Thus, as you can see here, these are the three always babies that were born to a woman residing in Sambuangal del Norte in Southern Philippines. Jeto is already 19 years old. Nisa is 16 years old. And in comparison, Charlie's is only three years old but they all look the same. They are what we call cretins. And this is the outcome 
of uh, Zamboanga del Norte being the, well, the distinction, holding the distinction of being the valedictorian of the group. And that is why the Tyro Mobile has been, uh, well, you know, Tyro Mobile is, uh, has been there for the past 30 years. It started in Germany and they were uh, testing school aged children before and uh, the outcome has been very good. And so we felt that, well, we need to borrow the Tyro Mobile. So in the year 2000, we borrowed the Tyro Mobile. It, went, it came to the Philippines during the tenureship of uh, the Secretary of Health, Manuel Dairit. It went around the country for a few months and then it has to return to Germany. But the problem persisted. And so we, we, we this problem, especially affecting the pregnant and lactating women, uh, the Tyro Mobile in the Philippines was born. And uh, it is a product of uh, a partnership between the IDIN Global Network, the Philippine Thyroid Association, the Rotary Club of University District Manila, Merck, the Thyroid Federation International, and a salt industry player, Salinas. It offers educational capacity building for the healthcare professionals, doctors, nurses, midwives, village health workers, nutrition scholars, targeting mostly women of reproductive age, WRA, and pregnant and lactating women, we screen them for, their, for the presence of goiter as evidence of uh, iodine deficiency. We give to them infographics to those who, are, who attend the seminar, the webinar, and we do also the point of care testing for TSH and FT4. Thyroid ultrasound is done on those with uh, palpable nodules. They bring in uh, their salt samples uh, used at home and we test their salt con iodization level and the urinary iodine concentration in some of these participants. For therapeutic, iodized oil capsules should have been given, but the absence of this in a worldwide level, uh, scarcity of the iodized oil capsule is a deterrent for this uh, therapeutic uh, in endeavor. So for those who are manifesting either hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism or the nodules, we just write up their prescriptions. For those who will require, for those who will require uh, surgical interventions already, we start referring to the hospitals and medical centers. And here is the typical picture of a lay forum attended by mostly women. Uh, they hear the talks for, on thyroid and pregnancy, for instance, and mythologies in thyroidology. Then uh, those with nodules undergo thyroid ultrasound. They all undergo TSH and FT4 testing and urine testing, and their salt samples are tested with WYD. The, their necks, necks of, their, of these patients are palpated and made an ultrasound image and all kinds of masses in the neck are seen. And here you can see here the, the uh, situation where a woman with goiter and becoming pregnant, uh, again, we always tell them that being goitrous and at the same time being becoming pregnant is a bad combination. And well, you can see the differences and mostly either diffuse enlargement or nodular enlargement of these uh, women. So the Tyromobile was born on account of this and the the idea is to turn iodine into intelligence. So the infographic materials that are being distributed to them are read. We hope that uh, all of these women will read them because uh, it is very important to educate them as the, uh, as the woman of the home. And it's very important that uh, they know exactly what happens 
with the, the, the brain development of their child as it grows. Unfortunately, the salt tested that uh, these participants had brought in only turned out to be very minuscule in terms of the passing in the threshold. What I'm saying is that only 28% of their household salt are meeting the requirements of 15 to 40 parts per million. And these are quantitative. Uh, it's no longer what we call uh, a change in the color of the salt uh, as a medicine, as a chemical is dropped. No, it is a quantitative measure. And so it speaks of the inadequacy of the Asin law, or what we call the salt law, uh, that the that the levels of iodization is, that is ultimately the household receives is inadequate for uh, uh, optimal iodine nutrition. So here we come to the crux of the matter, the Mother Baby Iodine Initiative of Thyroid Federation International with the main objective of rescuing the IQ. Rescue the IQ is a, is a hashtag that we have adopted to impress upon the uh, participants and all of the general public that there is need to do a rescuing effort, intervention early enough so that the IQ of these babies or these children will be made and restored to the higher level. Because if not, then we are doomed to have those cretins born among our population. So it's a project that uh, is deemed to involve global organizations, medical professionals, government health departments, the food industry, and of course, patients' organization. Each of these sectors has its own role to play, not only formulating policies, educating patients, promoting laws, and overseeing the iodine intake of the population, and providing levels of iodine in the salt and processed foods, and of course, ultimately, promoting awareness. So finally, what do we make out of this? That the thyroid health is important to emphasize, and we have been doing that through the Tyromobile. We increase awareness through the capacity building and education of those people who are attending them. And, and of course, they serve as the vehicle for their in the household. We do the diagnostic service delivery to them, and more particularly, the salt testing, which, uh, as you have seen, is not very encouraging at of the present time. There are clinical thyroid disorders and iodine deficiency disorders that are prevalent in many parts of the, country, of the world. They affect millions. They, have, they impose a serious global burden of disease. They are preventable through adequately iodized salt. And so we are here to promote the thyroid disorders as NCD because as an NCD, it will have a bigger role to play in the world arena. Thyromobile is seen as a vehicle for thyroid health delivery, especially to vulnerable communities but we do not look at it as a vehicle only. We look at it as a model for local government units to replicate so that it can provide more service to other constituents in their localities. The Tyromobile will, should serve as a template for partnership among government organizations, non-government organizations, civic organizations, the industry, salt industry, food manufacturing industry, they are as vital stakeholders as every one of us. 
The Tyro Mobile is uh, supposed to be the herald of communication handles to promote rescue the IQ because no other hashtag has this uh, distinction of uh, uh, that connotes urgency and that con that connotes also the fact that uh, the target population are the most vulnerable of them all. And particularly, the Tyro Mobile should serve as a pattern for similar countries affected by iodine deficiency disorders as in your country, in, Niger in Nigeria, to initiate similar approaches. It's very easy to do. It will only involve, well, capacity building, diagnostic services, and therapeutic services at that. But the most important is that we champion the advocacy for preventing diseases like thyroid as a non-communicable disease. And with that, we hope that after this has been all said and done, we improve global health. We would like to again thank you, thank the uh, organizers for this webinar, for the opportunity of uh, providing this uh, mini lecture on the Tyro Mobile and its implication on uh, improving global health. Thank you very much. And in Nigerian, Nagode, Imila, Dalu. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Theo. That was a great presentation, a very brilliant one at that. Thank you very much for this great awareness. And uh, I, I want to appreciate you for the great job you're doing in the Philippines through Tyrone Mobile. Uh, our wish is that all these will be replicated in Nigeria and Africa uh, for greater impact. Thank you very much. Uh, because of time, we are going to please, we implore all and encourage all participants. There's going to be a question and answer uh, session. Kindly drop your question at the um, question tool so that we'll pick it up and the presenters will be able to address them in, uh, specifically. So on that note, we are going to introduce the second presenter for today. And uh, we have here Dr. Adefemi Afolabi. Uh, he is a well-known, renowned authority in endocrinology in Nigeria. He's our own here in Nigeria. He obtained his Bachelor of Medicine degree and Bachelor of Surgery degree at the prestigious University of Ibadan. In 1987, he became a fellow of the West African College of Surgeons in 1997, um, an academic member of the Department of Surgery and consultant surgeon to the University College Hospital Ibadan. He is presently a consultant endocrine, endocrine and general surgeon at the University College Hospital Ibadan. He is also the founder and the uh, founder of Thyroid Care Association of Nigeria. We've done a lot of partnership. We partnered with them, and uh, this is why we have gotten to where we are today. He has been a very great support to TASTI, our own organization, and today he is coming to lecture us on. Um, thyroid disease in Nigeria and the role of um, advocates in piloting thyroid health awareness and uh, support for the people affected by thyroid disease. Dr. Afolabi, you have the stage. Sir, thank you very much for coming. Uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Um, what I am trying to do is to share my slides uh, for this uh, presentation. And um, I must thank uh, um, a professor for um, the presentation that has gone ahead of me. 
which actually sets the tone for where um, no governmental organization will have uh, a role to play in, the, uh, in this uh, discussion. So are we focusing on the what led, for example, to the establishment of uh, uh, terror care uh, based on some searches that we conducted previously? And uh, how we have been able to impact on the uh, global health through the care of, through the increased awareness of our patients um, in the country. So the, I should have shared this slide earlier on, I'm sorry. It's asking for some things. Okay. So I keep on talking as I, I go about it. So, uh, like I was being introduced, I'm a, a general surgeon with a social specialty in the endocrine surgery. I work as a lecturer at the University of Badon, Nigeria, and uh, I'm also a consultant surgeon to the University College Hospital in Nigeria as well. The two institutions uh, are like, a, I describe them as Siamese twins, actually, in the way we operate. Um, so our uh, medical students in the university have their clinical training in the, um, in the uh, hospital uh, as we have them. So it is important that uh, we have collaboration between the two institutions um, that uh, work together uh, to have a good training for our students and for caring for our patients as well. So for us in the endocrine division, we work together with our physician, endocrinologists, with our, we have a tumor board and a thyroid study group in our hospital uh, through which uh, we collaborate with respect to patient care. And uh, we also try to ensure that our patient get the best of quality uh, that they need in terms of care. And this usually takes us to uh, having to work um, along with them uh, together. I think the screen is shared very soon now. Uh, it's, so, just okay. Yeah, it's working. So, uh, my, so it's very good now. My video is sharing now. Um, but I hope you can see, uh, hear me. So, I've uh, titled this uh, Improving uh, Global as True Terror Awareness and uh, looking at the roles of uh, non governmental organizations in Nigeria. I must thank Queen uh, uh, Ofotube uh, for making this possible uh, with the support of the Terror Federation International uh, for giving me this opportunity to talk at this webinar. I'm going to look at the roles of non-governmental organizations in Nigeria uh, with respect to the theme of this uh, webinar because you cannot emphasize the role they need to play to make whatever policy, whatever program we have it is believed that uh, when we involve the people in policy formulation, they are likely going to uh, make the program to work eventually. Working at the local government levels, working at the cities and towns through the, uh, in our own setup, through the kings in particular, uh, who people command, who command the people's respect will help. In order to get entrance to a particular community, you need to see the head of the community. So if we are bringing terrible mobile, for example, to Nigeria, we need to work not only through governments, but through the traditional uh, uh, kings of the particular area we are going to. So it's important. So they are part of the stakeholders and they're a great vehicle that uh, can be used in doing this are the non-governmental organization, not-for-profit organization that work in Nigeria. Who will be a link with uh, our foreign partner as you come along. Um, so that's my name. I've already done that earlier on. 
and um, so this the so we as soon as I joined the faculty staff after coming back from my uh, residency training program, I came back to the faculty staff. One thing that I observed was that uh, uh, despite the fact that uh, uh, one of our trainers, old trainers who are retired by then, I developed some surgical techniques for treating giant goiters. Uh, we were still seeing big goiters uh, in, the, uh, in the 20s, more than three decades later. We therefore conducted a study uh, to uh, know why people still come with giant goiters, uh, despite the method that had been described to treat them in the past. Uh, so the outcome of the study, we believe, we found the basis for public awareness uh, campaign. So we interviewed about 120 patients, exactly 120 patients at their first presentation in the clinic. And we took their bio data, uh, the symptoms, duration of symptoms, why they have come to the clinic and the reason for the earlier presentation, the WHO grade of goiters as a den, which has changed now, and the diagnosis of the patient, which tell us a spectrum of the type of diseases we see in Nigeria as well, beyond uh, the one that are uh, due to iodine deficiency, which uh, as a this study, we see the commonest. Uh, we can see from this slide that uh, uh, the range of presentation is from four months to 29 years. So we have a patient who had had enlarged thyroid gland for 29 years. And we have a young uh, child, just so that's four months. That certainly will be one of the uh, type of patients that uh, our professor presented earlier on. Uh, with this table is showing that uh, more than three quarter of the patients present uh, more than a year after they observe their symptoms. What you also observe was that uh, those who present early, uh, the patients who have thyrotoxicosis, uh, who have heat intolerance, insomnia, tremulousness, and other signs and symptoms of thyrotoxicosis, they are likely to present earlier than those people who have iodine deficiency disorder, which will just cause painless swelling in the elderly patient, um, and so on and so forth. Or the child will also be brought early by the parents. Um, is what you also notice, <clears throat> excuse me, Dr. Aflabi, mm, yes, sir. The slide show because now we see only black, but when you have all the slides, we can see it. Oh, okay, on okay, your PowerPoint. So, not in this mode, we cannot see it's only black. Okay, now we, so we can see it now. Okay, yes. so I just move up. Thank yes. you very much for that observation. Okay, so, um so what we find was that uh, those people commonly are the symptomatic patients, either because they saw a swelling. And we noticed that uh, about 92% uh, 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 of the patients come with very large goiters in that uh, slide. Now, this eighth slide is about the clinical diagnosis of the patients we saw. So those who follow that simple goiter essentially are uh, those patients who might have been due to iodine deficiency disorder, but we could not completely rule out those that are due to genetic disorder as well. Remember that last year, the theme of Thyroid Federation International was inherited thyroid disorders, uh, which I had the opportunity of giving a lecture on uh, the program organized by Thyroid Awareness and the Support Initiative in Lagos, Nigeria, organized by uh, uh, Queen uh, Fortube. The next common group is the thyrotoxic patients, 25%. They form a quarter of the uh, patients we have in the country at that, at that particular study. And the reason for this is because of the universal salt iodization policy that the government has introduced since the 90s, uh, which similarly have reduced the uh, amount of people who have iodine deficiency disorder um, in the mix of these patients. So that made those people who have toxic goiter to come to have increased in a month, which is what we're also experiencing now. But certainly, the patients who have iodine deficiency disorder are still more than the other group of patients. Those who have neoplastic goiter, either benign or malignant, just consider about 4.2% uh, and 1.7% were hypothyroid. Um, I will show a picture of a typical child we saw. But we see more of adult patients. Oh, we have a reason to explain this. 
um, if we do not say, which is where Terramobile will be very uh, helpful in our country, if a policy like that is uh, established, where we screen pregnant women as part of their screening, when they come to register for antenatal care, uh, we screen them with thyroid stimulating hormone at early part of their um, pregnancy so they can detect those who may have hypothyroidism and treat them accordingly. Or preferably, we even screen people before they get pregnant, um, like we noted before, because it'd be too late for somebody to have a goiter and get pregnant. That fetus will not get adequate thyroxine from the mother. So neoplasm also seems to be common now uh, in that why it seems not to be common before is that uh, some patients uh, used to undergo partial thyroidectomy, but now that uh, most of our patients undergo thyroidectomy, we're able to examine the entire gland instead of uh, only part of the gland. And uh, I mentioned about the hypothyroid uh, cases earlier on. So this is an example of a patient who has uh, a simple greater than grade three. As we look at it, it appears that uh, it's only one loop that actually is affected in this, uh, the only direct loop is affected in this uh, patient. So this probably will be due to an adenoma because if it were due to iodine deficiency disorder, we expect it to involve uh, the two loops uh, with nodules forming or diffusely. So these are examples of patients who may have uh, malignancy or neoplasm in them. Now, this is a typical case of what uh, Professor have been talking about earlier on. This young boy was 15 years old by the time he came to us. He was 15. We can look at the status and look at the motorola greater on the neck, which actually shows the shape of the thyroid gland. You can see the lobes and the isthmus. Now, what are the reasons why these patients come late? Either they have iodine deficiency disorder, or yes, those who come with a non-toxic goiter uh, without erythrocytosis, why do they come late? The major reason is because they are ignorant of this disease. They do not know anything about the disease, what danger it portends to them, to their babies, what dangers it portends to them in terms of carrying cancer around, and uh, they do not know. So it's only those people who are erythrocytic that the symptoms will lead them to come early. So they are not aware. And this is an opening for us to campaign, to set up an awareness program. So this is what we derive from this uh, small study, which was what we set out to. Knowing the reasons why people come late will help us to uh, go into the community and give them education and awareness. Lack of funds, uh, money is hard to come by, especially now that there's an um, economic glut worldwide. Another reason that people are given some people believe so much in our traditional method of treatment. Um, so they will try that for some time before they come for uh, orthodox medicine. The great one is fear of surgery. They come late because they are afraid of surgery. So if a woman has a goiter and is afraid of surgery and is iodine deficient, that means she could have been getting pregnant. Indeed, one of the reasons we explained for goiter being common in women is the the need for thyroid gland to enlarge, to be sufficient for both the mother and the baby. So certainly common in women, apart from the other physiological changes in lactation or even at puberty. So each pregnancy makes a demand on the thyroid gland. That means that most of our women are not sufficient before they go pregnant. So the thyroid gland are to enlarge. So the reasons of people came late because their gland was uh, painless. There are other reasons that are due to systemic uh, issues. So that made us to establish the Thyroid Care Association of Nigeria, uh, which are funded. But I must say that, like I mentioned earlier on, that when the end users are involved in the particular policy or drive, it succeeds a lot. That is why thyroid awareness and support initiative is making great strides in Nigeria, because it's led by survival of thyroid toxicosis. So, I've done this study since uh, in the early 20s until I got a patient who had a goiter, who was so curious about it. She was afraid of surgery. And at the end of the treatment she received, she encouraged me to establish the organization. Indeed, she's the secretary of our, our board. Uh, so it shows the role of patients, of stakeholders in uh, uh, moving our policies forward. 
there are other patients as there are other patients around as well who are part of the team that are running this project together. So it's a non-for-profit organization established four years ago. And we want to be the primary source of independent accredited information on thyroid related disorders in Nigeria. And we have been playing that role uh, very well. And we wanted a world where patients with thyroid disease will have choice to be treated according to their individual needs and where the patient's needs are paramount or paramount importance. And then, so the, our mission then by establishing it, having found out from that study I mentioned earlier on, was to establish thyroid health education and awareness campaign in the country and to offer information, education, and support to patients and family. We also aimed, our mission which we are currently running is to raise the awareness about the consequences of thyroid disease, consequences of iodine deficiency, and the benefits of maintaining thyroid health throughout Nigeria and beyond. How have we been achieving this? We have been collaborating with secondary school because we did another study that showed that uh, most of the patients we study about their knowledge and perception of thyroid disorders uh, were not aware, they didn't have beyond secondary school education. So that people who are beyond that are able to know about thyroid disorders from their friends or from the internet. So we have been focusing on secondary schools to give them education on thyroid uh, disorder, iodine deficiency disorder at that younger age so that they'll be able to know before they get married and now start having children. We have been collaborating with other uh, non-government organizations, especially thyroid awareness and support initiative. Uh, the first time we collaborated was uh, International Thyroid Awareness Week of last year, 2023. And last year uh, in Ibadan, uh, the thyroid care uh, gave a lecture to a large number of students, almost up to 1,000 students uh, from the Thyroid Baptist uh, Model School in Ibadan. And it was well attended. We asked them questions to show that they understand uh, the talk and they got uh, prices for that as well. Now, this is a photograph we took uh, when we went to Lagos to collaborate with Stasi, and uh, one of the members of my board came along with me, and the, the chair of our board is also in that photograph as well. This is the thyroid queen, as we call her, as she, she's called in our group. She's the queen, thyroid queen of Tassi, and you can see her princess. Some of them are volunteers, most of them are patients who have benefited greatly from my initiative, the support she gives them in getting adequate care. Most so through this type of uh, uh, engagement with the public, we try to give education to the public to prevent other disorders for those we can pre uh, prevent. Of course, no matter how much iodide salt we give, we not be able to control those who have uh, genetic disorders or toxic water or neoplasm. But one good thing about iodine disorders is that uh, since Nigeria introduced um, iodide, 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 iodide of salt in the country, the trend of thyroid cancer has changed from follicular thyroid cancer that has changed to papillary thyroid cancer, which has a better prognosis. So that's a great achievement of which thyroid mobile we also make in the Philippines and any, any part of the world where it's established. It will change the pattern of thyroid cancer. We have documented that in publication that we have now more of papillary cancer than the uh, less prognostically good uh, follicular cancer. Last year, we had a recording from the television station because we have found that, uh, yes, it is good to have a, a lecture in the hall with the students, but we're going to get wider audience about whatever program we're going to use through the media. So we engage television stations, radio stations. Uh, we also uh, make use of them as well. Last year and this year, these are two different photographs. We went to this station. We usually have a television broadcast, which is live and the, our TV stations also have live stream concurrently on the social media as well. We do this during and outside of Global Terror Awareness Day week and then month. All I'm talking about is also what TASI does, apart from helping patients to get treatment for their surgery, which is a great role they play. Uh, but we are looking towards not getting many patients who have thyroid iodine deficiency disorder, so that we'll be left with those we cannot control those who have thyroidosicosis or those who have cancer. Or well, we can see also big people to have uh, cancer with uh, a good prognosis. Uh, we provide patient support initiative by former patients 
We also give a talk to patients and individual patients. I mentioned the broadcast live. Um, along with TASI also, we did a, we did a program in a popular uh, online station that was very successful as well. Here we have a patient uh, who was afraid of surgery, came before us. I was in the middle, and these are members of the board and the public health nurse uh, who helped on that occasion. These are four of us who took parts in the, the board members and the, the public health nurse. This year, TASI was everywhere in Lagos, most places in Lagos. They chose a particular local government and they really went very well with colorful display. I don't, stigma, I don't stigmatize thyroid patients. Thyroid disease is a non communicable disease. There are also a video they gave talk. She also gave talk of her own, on our own side as well to show the importance of all stakeholders, especially people who are survivors. I always tell my patients that I cannot tell you what you are going to go through because I never had a disease. So when I bring a patient survivor to talk to them through the patient support initiative, they appreciate it very well. Uh, this is our uh, social media Andrew. Uh, social media Andrew. I will uh, sort of end this by addressing an important topic. This I'm a surgeon. Uh, this uh, field of surgery. Uh, since that date, you see, before, before that date, 2004, almost 20 years ago, we have been performing to thyroidectomy in our patients. This is a debate among surgeons whether we should do partial thyroidectomy or thyroidectomy. I know that thyroid mobile is trying to make us not to have this disease to come to surgery. We also wish you don't have them come to surgery as well. But for those who come to surgery, the risk is that they, they may have cancer, so that some of them usually come back with recurrence. Or even if they are not cancerous, they may come back with a recurrent greater due to the iodine deficiency that they have or the genetic disorders that they have. I put a program I source from WebMG about the structures we actually are afraid of. Uh, we usually do capsular dissection so that we will not injure the parathyroid gland, which is the commonest complication. It's low calcium after surgery. The nerve is shown there. We don't go close to the nerve. We just keep close to the gland in capsular dissection as the, described by the grips. I'm showing sure us an example of a patient who probably must have suffered from iodine deficiency. All the glands are nodular. All the glands are nodular. So the question is, what part of the gland am I going to leave behind? When we do partial thyroidectomy for this type of patient, what then happens is that uh, the part we leave behind will never be sufficient for the patient. The patient becomes hypothyroid, and the patient will come back with another goiter. And uh, it's possible that there be cancer behind and this tissue left behind. So our policy is to offer the patient to thyroidectomy, except those who do want to take the risk of having a recurrent goiter or finding cancer eventually, or they are, it's difficult to take a thyroxine every day. They try to convince them to let them know. But if anybody doesn't want the surgery, it's an informed consent process that you go through. So we let them have the surgery that they want. They must have their say, like we said about uh, thyroid care in our mission earlier on. I will end with this. Uh, I'm going to end with uh, Theodore Koka. Uh, it's a Nobel Prize winner in medicine. He says that surgeons who, who take unnecessary risk and operate by the clock are exciting from the onlookers' point, standpoint, but they are not necessarily those in whose hands you, by preference, choose to place yourself. You must have brought this out of experience that terrorist surgery is something that is very, very delicate, that each step is taken to prevent complication because the complication can be lifelong. The patient may even say that, why not leave me alone? Why go through the surgery? So we take our time to do the surgery. I want to appreciate the Terror Federation International for supporting the Terror Awareness Support Initiative in organizing this webinar. I also uh, see a great opportunity for collaboration with our own association as well. And I thank all the participants who are able to attend this webinar globally. So like, uh, uh, this is a lady of what to be said earlier on. I think it's time for feedback, comment, and question. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Polavi. That was very, very exceptional. I promise 
the audience today that they're going to have a great time. So that's, I feel like going on and on and on, but we have to leave because we have a time frame. Thank you very much for covering everything. You covered everything. It has been a wonderful time with you and Professor Theo. So at this time, we want to um, delve into the question and answers. And uh, to Dr. Leo, I will start from you. Someone is asking, how can you turn iodine into intelligence? Can you please bring this answer? Yes. Well, you see, the, the uh, intelligence, the eye and the iodine, they are, you may say, mnemonics. Uh, the, to answer the question of how to turn iodine into intelligence would have to go through, again, the lecture by reminding particularly the mother that she must have a iodine iodine sufficient diet during her pregnancy that her thyroid glands should be assured that there are no nodules that she is not hyperthyroid nor hypothyroid and uh, all of the other things that uh, need to be you know uh, observed during pregnancy in other words proper diet and more particularly to the issue of uh, micronutrient, you know, folic acid, iodine, and all the other multivitamins that you need. All of these are multifactorial. And so it is not actually iodine alone that will be sufficient to turn into an intelligent boy or girl. It is a composite of factors, but what we, but what we would like to highlight in this seminar is the role of the micronutrient iodine and its sufficiency in the diet and through the use of adequately iodized salt during her pregnancy will assure her and the family that the intelligence of the baby will be more or less optimal when the time comes. Thank you very much. That is to tell us that Sufficient iodine is very critical in the growth and development of children right from pregnancy. And Dr. Afolavi, during his own uh, presentation, talked about pre-screening and also pregnancy screening, screening women that have product uh, uh, pregnancy stage and those people that are pregnant. So they all work hand in hand. So I also will implore every one of us, the participants, to drop their questions at the uh, question tool. We're going to take them, and the ones we, we won't be able to take because of time, they're going to be sent to your answered and sent to your email. Then this question is coming to uh, um, Dr. Falabi. The, 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 the person say, asked, he said, what kind of thyroid disease is more prevalent in Nigeria? from your own uh, perspective or your own opinion? A very okay. vital question. It's a very vital question. The limitation we have uh, to differentiate between those that are due to iodine deficiency disorder and those that are due to genetic disorder is that we are unable to carry out genetic studies on them. Otherwise, we will say, because we have geographical expression in Nigeria, that makes many areas with their deficient. So we have areas of Nigeria where goiters are common, and we believe those are due to urine deficiency. Anywhere we have hills and mountains, which erosions washes away the uh, surface of the soil, which contains iodine mainly, they usually have a uh, goiter in those areas. So we ascribe those to be due to urine deficiency. So I would say that is still the commonness, even with the study we did. Only Probably only a few of them, if able to analyze them genetically, will be due to uh, will be due to genetic uh, cause. Most of them will see due to iodine deficiency. So that's it, the commonest cause. But we are trying to get less of them, and that is why the other types are coming on, like teratosicosis, is becoming more apparent now. 
because the ones that are due to non toxic greater are reducing, thyroid cancer are coming up. We cannot know as cancer, even though it's not thyrotoxic, until we take out the entire gland and know that uh, uh, it is cancer, which is why we offer them total the surgery. So in that sense, the common cause will still be iodine deficiency disorder, but we need to take out those that may be due to genetic disorder, uh, those may be due to uh, cancer. But one will advise that we'll assume that whoever has greater or lives in an area that may develop greater should be fortified with iodine through their diets, which is what Theromobile is uh, doing a great job in Philippines. We would like a replication of this in Nigeria as well. So I would say Thermobile is very much welcome to Nigeria. We can collaborate with you. Yes. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, I said that the Thermobile is not a fan. I mean, you uh, really vehicle. speaking, it is a fan, it's a vehicle, but <laughs> it is more of a concept. It's a more yes. of a concept that should be sold to different countries particularly in the areas where iodine deficiency is most prevalent. They should adopt this concept and operationalize it to the best okay. of Very simple, very. Okay. You need only to network with the stakeholders, the various stakeholders. Very good. Doctor, Dr. Theo, please, can you tell us the major stakeholders of this Tyro uh, Mobile? Well, uh, what we started with, uh, with uh, the, 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 Sali the Salinas, or it's a salt industry player who lent us the uh, van. Okay, that was the major step because the van is the device or the mobility issue uh, takes care of it, you know. But as I said, the equipments they're in are all portable. Portable ultrasound, the portable point of care, and uh, centrifuges, test tubes, all of those things are very portable. You really don't need a vehicle to transport it. Uh, it can even be in the car, for instance. You know, But what I'm saying is that uh, the Tyro Mobile is as a concept is uh, something that can be easily adapted by everyone. Every municipality, every province, or every region can do it, provided that the stakeholders are there. Like for instance, you resource speakers, resource persons who is who will who will be deployed in mob in mobile and mobilized to do the screening of the neck of patients. You know, we are screening hundreds and hundreds of patients every event that we have. And so all of these are screened primarily. And if there are no symptoms, no physical signs, then they go home. We, we tell them, okay, you're doing okay, you can go home. But for those who have symptoms uh, on a checklist that we distribute beforehand, and uh, we sit with them, uh, uh, in a very uh, facilitated manner. And uh, then we get the blood examinations and then thereafter the, examine, the uh, results are given back. So we need to have this uh, point of care test, the ultrasound and then the salt testing. These are all portable. They need not be in a, unlike a mobile X-ray van, you really need a mobile van wherein your equipment will have to be housed. But in Tyromobile, it's not. It can it can be, it can even be called a car mob mobile, so to speak. Uh, all it needs is the partnership between the, the, the resource speakers. That is why your thyroid care in Nigeria can provide the expertise that will go around and screen the patients. And then, of course, the important thing is the uh, local government unit participation, because after all, particularly in the Philippines, I'm speaking of the Philippines, we need to be inter, uh, in, we, we, we need to be interacting with the local government units because they are the ones who 
can easily mobilize the patients that they see uh, in the villages. They assemble these patients, and that's the time when we come in. So the local government units must be tapped. And then also to provide logistics are, for instance, the civic organizations like uh, Rotary Clubs, like JCs, like Kiwanis, uh, and, and, and all of these other civic organizations or non-government organizations, faith-based associations. They can easily be mobilized and say, look, we are doing a public service to your constituency. So something that uh, will really excite them and uh, with all of these uh, hands in and helping one another, then it becomes very easy to do. Uh, in our experience, well, we have very little budget to do it, but uh, with, with the necessary collaboration and cooperation extended by our stakeholders and by the local community, we were able to move throughout the Philippines. It's very easy to do. And we encourage countries with high prevalence of iodine deficiency and goiter for that matter, as Dr. Uh, 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 Afo Labi had mentioned, uh, they can easily move. The next steps that we are planning is already more on the more on the surgical missions because we have seen so many of them and they are, you know, as uh, as he mentioned already, it takes them years before they can, uh, before they seek access to healthcare because of poverty, as what he said, because of, uh, because of fear, because of no access to healthcare, uh, it lingers on. And that is why we would like to, um, you know, awareness is something very vital. And that is where uh, um, patient organizations, medical associations can come in to uh, render their assistance. Thank you very much, Dr. Steele. That was wonderful, very explicit. And there's a very important question here. It says, Goita, hypothyroidism, autoimmune thyroiditis, are there epidemiolog epidemiological data? Are there epidemiological data? Yes. Uh, the question goes to, because we are operating in different two different regions. So uh, Dr. Folavi, is there an epidemiological data in Nigeria about goita, hydro, hypothyroidism, and autoimmune thyroiditis. So what the, the best way to get a, a data is to do uh, a public-based screening. You can only uh, translate the little one we did in the hospital-based screening that the, that's about the patient who come to the hospital. So we're not be able to get the actual ratio of which one is common now, which one, but it will be a reflection of what is happening to society. So there will have been studies. People have studied uh, the physicians, the laboratory physicians have studied issues of iodine deficiency, urinary iodine in some parts of, different parts of the country. So like I mentioned to you yesterday, there will certainly be a document with the federal government that will indicate uh, which of these disorders are common. But I can predict it will not be different from what uh, we have talked about. The only one that one may say uh, people should uh, uh, be wary of is the one that autoimmune based diseases, like mentioned thyroiditis, for example, or great disease, uh, autoimmune based diseases. When they occur, it's like a permanent disease. That's the way I see it. So when I have a patient who have a uh, for example, uh, great disease, other autoimmune based disease that is causing hypothyroidism or hypothyroidism, I usually will advise that uh, we take out the entire gland for the patient and let them be on uh, uh, replacement iodine therapy. So, this is because if you take part of the gland away, the antibodies will still uh, stimulate the remnants of the tissue you left behind to cause a recurrence, and the patient will go through a lot of. Uh, 
uh, suffering again, and the second surgery is always more difficult. So there will be epidemiological studies. Uh, like I mentioned yesterday, if um, I've been tuned to uh, present such data, which actually uh, Professor Lewis has given us as well, what will have done it? But the little study I presented is a reflection of what happens in society. So um, because some of them need special investigation to confirm, uh, we cannot really confirm great disease or autoimmune uh, paradises unless we do some uh, blood analysis to really confirm. We can only suggest clinically based on the appearance of uh, AB bulging eyes, uh, we suggest great disease, but it's another one that may not be so uh, prominent, but that will be only picked up by uh, histology. We've got a few of Hashimoto thyroiditis diagnosed after histology. Again, we do not get to diagnosis preclinically. It's only after surgery, the histology will come back and say it's Hashimoto thyroiditis. So we have them as well. So you, they are also common in our area as well, but not as common as iodine that deficiency disorder or the frank Thank and you. consequences. Thank you very much, sir. Dr. Tio, I don't know who this question is. Is it possible for the thyroid levels to be high even after partial thyroidotomy, even when they are reduced, they are reduced to no symptoms after partial thyroidotomy? Is it possible for the thyroid level just briefly so that we'll be able to uh, uh, manage our time very well? We are almost, we are out of time already. Okay. I can, I can answer that quickly since our removal of the thyroid gland. In a patient who has a great disease due to autoimmune thyroiditis, I mentioned that in my earlier answer. When you remove part of the gland, the antibodies are still in the body, being produced by the body, and they will stimulate the gland to produce more thyroxine. So, thyroxine level will come up again eventually. That is the natural cause of events. So, it's possible. That's correct. That's correct. You know, and that is why. Uh... Uh, in, in patients who have uh, surgical indications, it might it might have uh, be it might be more uh, appropriate to remove just about everything because of the because of the antibodies that are going to proliferate and, and that are present and will will now uh, stimulate the remaining or the remnants to become bigger again, and so you have you end up with the same problem again. So I agree with our colleague, the surgical colleagues, that uh, uh, it's best that uh, when surgical when surgery is contemplated, that uh, the the best option is to remove everything and then replace it with thyroid hormone. Thank you very much, sir. And from my own experience, I found out that patients um, in our own climb here, they are always scared of oh. They, they, what they hear is you will take drugs for the rest of your life and they, well, became, they, yeah. they will become scared. I begin to request, oh, is there not going to be a portion of my thyroid gland that will be remaining? How can I take drugs? They, you know, those are the things they hear from, uh, 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 from people that are not well informed and they begin to build their imaginations around it. And sometimes the doctor may be forced to kind of do a partial thyroidotomy yeah, to satisfy the patients, but then uh, some of them they don't. They will sit down and address the patient very well to know what is best option for the patient. So finally, sir, which test can I do again after surgery because I detected another swollen and feeling, another swelling and feeling something moving inside whenever I swallow something. I have done scan, that is a ultrasound, but it shows nothing. How well, do we address uh, it? Uh, as an internist first, you know, uh, before the surgeon speaks. You know, uh, the, the most effective way of dealing with this problem of uh, misconceptions is to educate them. There is no substitute for them knowing the entire truth. You can tell them that, look, if you remove only the right lobe and leave the left lobe because of the fear that they don't want that, you know, they don't want to be uh, taking medications for a lifetime. You can tell them, OK, this is your option. If you remove the left lobe 
what happens now to the right lobe? Then the right lobe becomes hypertrophy, hypertrophied, or it enlarges compensatorily, for instance. And you can tell then the example of, okay, here's a couple, and the one couple died, the one partner, and so the other one will take over. And, you know, she, the, the, the remaining, usually the wife, will have to work harder because she is now the only one provider. So she has to be the, <laughs> the provider of uh, instead of two. And so what happens? She has she, she will have to be working doubly hard and it becomes bigger and bigger. And then before you know it, that remaining portion will be a, a you go you get to the same problem again and again. And so uh, I will defer to uh, our surgical colleagues here, Dr. Okumobe, so, that, uh, so, that uh, you take over the uh, information. Yes, sir. yes sir. So it's about communication and empathy. I will empathize with the patients that I know it is tough on you. Some of us are also on lifelong medication. As we grow older, people become hypertensive. There are some people younger than you who are diabetic who have to take their medication regularly every day. It just happened that you have to fall into this group of non-communicable diseases. That is the way we see it now. So we try and convince them that, you know, it's a body. You have to empathize. I know the body you face when you do that. But certainly, it will come back. Let us not forget. I always tell them, the thyroid gland is one gland. It's one. It only happened to sit on the trachea and make it into two lobes. You understand? So whatever you do to one side, whatever happened to one side, one loop, will open to the other loop eventually, like Professor Lewis has said. So it's only one gland. It's only one gland. It's like uh, he said, a couple. A couple have been joined together. If one yeah. is separated, the other couple, the other member of the couple have to compensate, have to get bigger. So we just show communication skills, empathize with our patients. And we use patient support initiative. I believe that uh, somebody like uh, uh, yes. uh, Ambassador Roma will be able to convince many more patients than me, a doctor. That's part of because, our work. That's part of because our work. Because, gone, because she has gone through it. Every day. <laughs> gone through yes. it before. <laughs> so we use our patients to convince other patients to also tolerate uh, total thyroidectomy as well. And by the way, we are seeing a lot of recurrence a recurrence that are even bigger than the initials. And we had, we had a patient that has recorded such that uh, it has gone behind the pharynx. We could not even remove it. And there are many patients come like that. They turn out with cancer. You can't go back to remove the cancer. The first time is always the best time, like in life. The first time is always the best time to do anything in life. The first time is always the best time. And then maybe best. you can also tell them as an, uh, about the economics of taking medications uh, you can say then you can say to them that the, the cost of uh, a levothyroxine tablet is uh, much less than what they are expecting they may be thinking that this will run to hundreds of dollars for instance no mm -hmm. you can tell them that the cost of levothyroxine is very cheap i mean in our country it is very cheap at least so i think that's one of the factors that drive them scared that uh, they will have to be taking medication for the rest of, life, of their life and they will be spending a lot of them, a lot of yeah. financial for this. No, you have to disabuse their mind. And maybe you can, you know, as patient organization, you can very well uh, interact with the pharmaceutical companies that are supplying these products and uh, assure these patients of yours that uh, the economic, uh, consequence of uh, taking this is uh, minimal, minimal, minimal. Thank you very much, sir. This case, if we continue, we will not live here. In fact, the, our own problem here, the challenge is the belief system. You know, just mere hearing that you're going, they, you know, it's when they come in, I begin to explain to them that it's just one tiny pill that does not disturb you from anything is, uh, what I used to convince them is that it is just like a supplement, the way you take your supplement, it's not a drug because it's going to replace the hormones that your thyroid gland would have been producing in you. So don't see it as a medication. 
just see it as a supplement, as a food that you take first thing in the morning when you wake up. So it, our own is the belief system where people believe, oh, I'm going to have a, a, a buffet, a, 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 you know, a buffet of drugs taken all through my life. So not until you explain to them what it is, they will agree with you. And they'll be fine they're doing. And most of them that have complied, they're doing very well. So the, the, I would say by give credit to Tasi and uh, Tarot Cast to say what we've been doing. And this Tasi has about 210 patients, beneficiaries of uh, thyroid, uh, thyroidotomy, and they're doing very well. They're doing very, very well. So on this note, once again, I want to appreciate, we're going to, please, I want to plead with our participants, don't go, we want to have a group picture. I believe the technical person is uh, working on the picture. It's nice we take a good picture to create memories about this, um, um, these programs. And also you can join uh, uh, TFI, you can subscribe to TFI YouTube page and Tasty YouTube page to you know, go through this, uh, uh, webinar once again from, to assimilate more of it. So on this note, I want to specially, specially my, our special gratitude goes to our two presenters here. That was wonderful. Dr. Leo has, Dr. Theo has been very busy. We've been fixing and postponing and fixing since May. And I'm so happy that today is a reality. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Abolabi, for always coming to, for, to, for any anytime he's called upon, he's always there. He's always there to give his best in advancing thyroid awareness in Nigeria. He's too passionate about it. And this collaboration, he has been very, 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 you know, passionate about the co collaboration to advance and promote thyroid health and also global health at large. Thank you very much. I don't even, I lack words to appreciate all of you for taking out your time to be with us and to educate people. And I believe that this program will enrich people's experience and also help to foster more co collaboration and to take action, just like I mentioned before. And I want to appreciate, it's our pleasure also to have our participants from across the globe I am not taking it for granted. Thank you for your time. Thank you for everything you have invested to be with us. And I believe your coming here is not, uh, is not ordinary. You have gained a lot. So we hope that all the presentation and everything enrich your understanding of thyroid health. And also our gratitude goes to Thyroid Federation International for their assistance and support towards this webinar. is they, they, they have given us immense support in making sure that this webinar comes up and that the output is top notch. And we have achieved it today. And to all our distinguished guests, we value your presence and participation, your questions and your engagement. We encourage you to continue. For us to continue this discussion, join us in our mission also. We plead you to advance thyroid awareness and care globally. Very important. Thank you once again. And we look forward to future strategic collaborations and webinars like this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please wait behind for a picture. Carlo, please, can you help us for a group picture? Hello, Carlo. Carlos. Hello, I'm here. Okay, is it possible to have a group pictures? A group picture? Okay, just stop the recording. Okay. <laughs>